Good evening, everyone, and welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Brian Gemza, reporting live as usual from sunny, beautiful West Texas, where uh, so far the storms have passed by Lubbock. I teach in the Texas Tech Honors College, and I'm pleased to represent the campus-wide initiative called Creating Livable Futures. It's focused on sustainability and resilience. It's a special privilege to work with the Sowell Family Collection and Literature Community and the Natural okay. World, an archive at Texas Tech that collects the work of writers who are scientists and humanists, and plenty of folks who are both. Uh, this evening, you will hear from Dr. Jerry North, who seems to have packed about 20 careers in science into his career. His research has taken him all around the globe and to plenty of places he never expected to be. And through it all, his curiosity has provided his jet fuel. Our goal here is to offer good fuel and company for your imagination too, uh, as part of our book series. The climate book series keeps in mind that climate is one of the original interdisciplinary subjects and that the group of us who care about climate is diverse and varied and yet united by concern and like Dr. North, by curiosity. We want you to be part of the party where we talk about literature and poetry and economics and politics and faith and psychology and family and just being human. In fact, just about everything interesting under the sun is part of that discussion. And that's why we need you to be part of it too. So that's our vision for this series. We've had a wonderful time with it uh, in this academic year. We're very glad you're here and that uh, Dr. North is with us this evening. So I will turn it back to you, Catherine, to introduce him. Thank you so much, Brian. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jerry North, who is one of my personal role models. When I arrived in Texas many years ago, I looked around, I thought to myself, who else is a climate scientist here in Texas? and Jerry was already here. He has done a lot of work specifically in our state, but he has also worked around the world as you'll hear about as we go along. And he is currently the University Distinguished Professor Emeritus at Texas A&M University in their College of Geosciences Department of Atmospheric Sciences. So as we go along, Brian and I have some questions we've already prepared to ask Jerry. We will then ask him to give a reading from some of the favorite parts of his book. His book, of course, is called The Rise of Climate Science, a memoir. And then we will take your questions. So you can put your questions at any time. If you're on Zoom, you can put them in the Q&A on Zoom. If you're watching on Facebook, because we are streaming live on Facebook too, you can just put your questions in the chat and as a comment below, and they'll be conveyed over here too. And for the last half of this, we'll be taking your questions. So whenever you have any questions that come up, go ahead and ask them. And um, as uh, Brian mentioned, Jerry's career spans decades. He has been doing climate science since before people even really understood there was something called climate science. So any questions you have, he will probably be able to answer. Feel free to bring those up as we go along. Brian, I'm gonna hand it over to you to ask the first question. Great. So. Um... Jerry, I loved your book because I'm a, a humanist who loves uh, math and science, uh, even when I sometimes feel I'm not particularly good at those things. And uh, one of my favorite things about the memoir is your surprising revelation that you weren't a particularly good math student in early days. Then you go on to say that if you're going to study physics, all you do is math, math, math. And you mentioned that reading and arithmetic were, were di difficult uh, for you. You tell the story of your uh, mentor, P.R. Bell, a man who was literally blinded by science, his vision dimmed from radiation, who said uh, he couldn't do math. You said he couldn't do math anymore, but his intuition and sound scientific judgment worked well. I'd love to hear more about that. Could you tell us about your knack, uh, as you put it, for looking at the big picture and other skills that have served you well in the course of your career? Uh, well, I, uh, I did have a, a hard time when I was a, a 
a youngster in middle school and so forth. Uh, I just, uh, I couldn't do arithmetic. <laughs> so so uh, I was just, uh, it, it, they looked like there was no hope for me in that direction. And I got over to, uh, I know I, I grew up in a uh, lower middle class family. Uh, and we would call them hillbillies now, I guess. And, uh, and when I, so I, when I left uh, high school, I was not a good writer at all. We just didn't do very much of it in school. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, you know, to be a good writer, you need to have people criticizing your work and you'll get better. But anyway, so, but when I got over to the university, um, I was even short a year uh, in math. I, my father uh, said, no, you should take Latin. Uh, and you should, you know, he, he thought I was a pretty bright kid and ambitious. He said, you can be a doctor, you know, <laughs> take Latin because that's how they write their prescriptions. <laughs> so, but uh, when I got over to uh, the University of Tennessee, you drive my old jalopy over there. Uh, and uh, uh, my, I get this advisor, he was a bi bacteriologist uh, because I thought, well, maybe I'll be a chemist. And so uh, he, he looked at me and, and he looked up at my scores and somehow or other I, I hit like in the 90s percentile in mathematics. So this is something strange. <laughs> well, I was good in geometry, you know, which doesn't have the same uh, thing to it as arithmetic and that sort of stuff. Uh, also, it had a bigger vision uh, aspect, as, as you said. Uh, and so really, I think my strength is not that I'm smart. Most of the people I ever worked with were much smarter, quicker than I, but I always had this uh, slightly better grasp of the bigger picture. And uh, that means in politics, it means, you know, by politics, I mean, trying to get something done in the, in the government uh, where you have to, you have to uh, sort of uh, read somebody's mind <laughs> and uh, you lose, see that bigger picture and what, what else uh, what else is affected by this or that? And I learned a lot of that just working in a store uh, when I grew up. A family that we knew had uh, clothing stores, and I worked there uh, every Saturday and every summer all through high school. And I learned how to, how to sell things. And later, that really came in handy. As a scientist, it's a very important, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, trait to have. So... But uh, so that's that's how it got uh, started. I worked there at Oak Ridge with P.R. Bell and many others. But he was, you know, and I was developing this kind of intuition. Uh, you can do it with mathematical equations, but I always always had some kind of pictorial view of the equation, and it becomes a language. Mathematics is is your language, but when you see the equation, you see the image of what it's about. So I guess that's. Uh, <laughs> that's how that, uh, that maybe that uh, I, I can still tell you that almost all of the people I worked with were much brighter, including the ones at A&M, every one of those people. And uh, but I, I guess I was good at getting people to do things that they wouldn't first want to do. Uh, and uh, so that's that that really worked a lot at NASA and then at A&M, too. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I, I think what they would say today is there's many different types of intelligence. Yes, and in right. addition to the straight up IQ of, you know, understanding the, the technical right. details, understanding why something matters and how to get something done, those are, those are possibly even more important skills. That's right. It, it is. It really is true, I think. Uh, but you do need those other folks, too. Those people who <laughs> never, make a, never make a mistake in their code. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so awful. My my hands don't hit the right buttons. I, I you know it's a dyslexia that I've had from childhood. I blame it on my I, I was left-handed, and my my father made me right-handed, uh, and uh, so you know those two the people who think in those different sides of their brain uh, are, are quite different, and I think I'm I'm like a left-handed person in many ways. Uh, and terrible in the right-handed side. <laughs>
<laughs> that put that may carry over to your brain as well. Well, well, you've already mm-hmm. mentioned um, uh, what I want to ask you next, which is um, a striking aspect of your career is that you are an early arrival to so many different fields and technologies that people just take for granted today, mm-hmm. like um, satellite observations, working with NASA. So how, how do you feel like your curio- how much of that was your curiosity and your sense of adventure and how much, much of that was just, you know, really good timing arriving places at just the right time to get in on these new discoveries? Well, I, as I say in the book, uh, th- there were so many forks in the road and for some reason, somehow or other, I chose the right one. And I don't, you know, if I'd cho- chosen the other one and, you know, sometimes it's like flipping a coin. Mm-hmm. I was really very lucky. So when I went to NCAR on sabbatical for my physics professorship, um, I didn't I didn't really uh, know that I was going to be in climate. Mm-hmm. I thought that sounded interesting. I'd been reading Jim Holden's books and things like that before I went out. I was a physics professor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, I knew a lot about math and how, how to solve problems, things like that. But uh, so when I got there, um, the, the fellow who was uh, in charge of the uh, advanced study program, which I, I was able to get a um, uh, stipend from them to, to stay for a whole, whole year. Uh, uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis paid half of, half of it for the, for the academic year. And then I stayed a whole summer at uh, NCARS. Uh, but anyway, so um, uh, just b- being there at the right time, that was, that was it. So there were people, Steve Schneider, who mm-hmm. you maybe didn't know, uh, but uh, you would have loved him <laughs> if you did. Uh, and, uh, and Bob Dickinson, they were two people. And so, you know, when I got there, I was trying to decide what to do. And Peter Gilman, who was running the advanced study program, I was thinking about maybe going into turbulence. He said, oh my God, don't do that. <laughs> that that's a meat grinder. <laughs> <laughs> you'll never, you'll never come out like a black hole. You'll, you'll never come out. So, so I, I, uh, they, they, uh, uh, Steve and Bob Dickinson uh, wrote a paper and they passed around the, the preprint and somehow it got to me. And I said, gee, this really looks fun, like fun. Maybe I can do it. I'm a dreadful programmer, so that I can't ever really be a GCM guy. Uh, but I, I, and they, they told me a couple of papers to read. And another fellow, Jim Coakley was there and Peter Chillick, uh, who is now uh, uh, kind of a skeptic about our business. <laughs> but anyway, that was a long time ago. And uh, we, uh, I got to know these people and I, I, by October, I got there in September one, by October, I had a problem to work on. And before Christmas, I had it solved. And uh, so that was really, uh, a great thing, you know, lucky, you know, I had no, I didn't know anything, but I knew how to do a problem like that. But first, you know, you have to ask the, a good question. I had the questions because I read some of the early papers about climate models. And so I saw a, there were, there's a, a kind of discrepancy between Bodico's paper, the Russian, and the, uh, the uh, University of Arizona uh, guy, Sellers. And uh, so what I did was cracked right between the two of them. And uh, it turned out that I explained how they were different, why they were different, and why they were still okay. Uh, and, and my, so I, get, I did that. So I was instantly um, somehow recognized in the business. So I wrote two papers that year and they won the award for, the, for NCAR that year. And that's pretty strange for a visitor to win. Uh, there was a little bit of, uh, frowning going on <laughs> among the permanent staff because the previous year uh, was also won by a visitor. <laughs> so, what about so, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> Jerry, I think this is insightful because also you're speaking to um, in describing how you think uh, something important about creative process and how some of us perhaps use uh, different parts of our brain for uh, unanticipated activities and uh, luck and timing seem to come into it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you write about, uh, oh, and 
by the way, uh, when you there's a great Yogi Berra uh, saying, when you come to a fork in the road, yes. take it, uh, <laughs> which you seem to have done in your career. So um, you talk about several times when you were uh, scooped by other uh, scientists. You had uh, Poisson, who came 200 years before your work. Uh, you also have uh, Kamalgarov, who uh, scooped you by about 40 years. Um, <laughs> I want to hear about your big scoops and how do you get to an original idea first? Uh, what talents do you ascribe to scientists who uh, make the kind of discoveries that uh, you've made? I, I cannot explain it, but uh, it does happen. Um, the first one was when I was working at Oak Ridge and I solved this problem. And it had such a clever, uh, clever, I don't, I'm not clever, <laughs> but, but you know, it just by, by, uh, by just luck, I discovered this way of, of solving this problem. And I thought, oh my God, this, I, this is really big. So I actually wrote a report. And at the time I was taking advanced calculus from, from a mathematician who worked at Oak Ridge. He later went on to Purdue where he finished his career but he was a German, uh, actually Swiss. And uh, Gauchi uh, was his name and a uh, wonderful man. He, he, he saw the report that I circulated, so I put him on the list. And uh, he, he says, you know, this is uh, the uh, Poisson summation formula <laughs> that, you, that you invented. <laughs> it was two or, two, or, two or 300 years ago, I don't know, Poisson, uh, but... Uh, but he told me, he says, you can find this in Ostrowski's calculus book. It's in the library at Oak Ridge National Lab, in German, of course. And I later found out, much later found out, that actually he was a student of Ostrowski's. <laughs> so, so that's why he was very familiar with that. No one else would ever have uh, come up with that funny thing, because it's not that widely known. Uh, I actually published a paper on it in American Journal of Physics many years later. <laughs> anyway, so, but, but you know, things like that uh, happen. Solving the problem at NCAR was like that. It just uh, dawned on me. And, and I'll never forget, I, I do mention this, I, I'm sure I do. This was a really strange occurrence. Then I was, when I came back from my sabbatical, my wife and I were having such bad problems. Uh, and uh, I was really very, very unhappy at that time. And I will never forget, it was on New Year's Day. I was all by myself. And I went over to my office to work on New Year's Day. And I had been fumbling trying to prove something for months, months. And that day, I proved it. <laughs> called the slope slip stability theorem, <laughs> having to do with the operating curve of a climate system. And uh, so that, that was another, how can you explain that? You know, usually, but then also going to a fresh place to work often is very stimulating uh, if you do that. You suddenly go, you meet new people. And a lot of times when I went to, went to Goddard Space Flight Center, um, people there thought I was older than I was because I had nearly gray hair at the time already. And I think they thought I was much better than I actually was. And I, 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 <laughs> I wore a tie and jacket every day. And I think that people, <laughs> so it, it made me uh, feel uh, kind of uh, important. And so my, my branch head, I mean, he just gave me total, he said, just do whatever you want to do. Do it, just have fun. And, and he says, I'll get you some contractors to work for you, help you program and all that stuff. So I lost any ability to program after that because I had a, my best programmer was a guy who had a PhD from Yale in astrophysics. <laughs> Young guy, really nice man and a hard worker, very creative in, in doing numerical work. and. Uh, and then several others there. So, you know, all these guys were so smart, but, you know, he had no interest in doing anything but that. And so, you know, you look at the larger picture. Uh, well, I can get this guy to do this. I can get these guys to do that. And one of, one of my 
group at Goddard, one of, one, he was a physicist. He had a PhD under a Nobel laureate at University of Chicago. And then he went to, I can't remember where, oh, he went to Cornell. His postdoc advisor was a Nobel laureate. <laughs> then he decided to go to NCAR where Chuck Leith, who I've mentioned in the book several times, great mentor to me at NCAR. And so, you know, that's the kind of person that I had working for me. Just amazing. He, he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. His name is Tom Bell. He's now retired from Goddard. Um, well, I can't say and, I'm surprised because my undergraduate degree was in astrophysics and that's where I learned how to code. Yeah. So, so when you do astrophysics, you have to know how to code if you want to do any type of research, yeah. even well, observation. I would have flunked out of that. No way. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, well, I always worked on, on problems that, that were simple, you know, simplified. That's another thing is, you know, when you're a physicist, you learn to first take out all the details, uh, like uh, Galileo and the, the block sliding down the inclined plane. Well, he, he said, uh, oh, forget about the friction. <laughs> and, and, you know, so he stripped it down and solved a simpler problem first. And that, that was really what I tried to do in almost every endeavor uh, is simplify it and, uh, uh, and then you can and solve that. And then you can start to put in more things to get it to work. That's when I call on these smart guys who can program. Mm -hmm. so, well, what, uh, um, what I love that your book talks about, what a lot of people don't know, and I learned about this myself in graduate school, is that back in the days of the Soviet Union, there was a lot of collaboration between American scientists and Soviet scientists in the area of climate modeling. In fact, Mikhail Budiko back in the 1960s was an early climate modeler from the Soviet Union. Yeah. I went to school myself. One of my professors, Michael Schlesinger, was one of the people who worked in the U.S. Oh, in yes. the Soviet Union a lot. I remember fact, Michael very well. Yes, he made his, his wife, Natasha, was from the Soviet Union. So I love the fact that in your book, you have this whole chapter on some of your experiences in the Soviet Union. Again, not Russia. We're talking about behind the Iron Curtain. Yes. So yes. I know, yes. I know yes. you're going <laughs> to. Oh, yes. So. What was that like working with scientists who, in some ways, you know, the math and the physics is the same, but the culture is so different. Yeah, the culture is very different. And in fact, the, the Soviets, um, because of the great uh, mathematician who was a couple of generations earlier, uh, Kolmogorov, uh, he uh, had these great students, um, Obukov and Monin, uh, and he made one of them an atmospheric physicist and the other one, he made uh, an oceanographer. They're both really famous for their contributions. And, and but working, uh, getting to know people there, I liked the scientists. Um, and, and several of I got really close to and enjoyed uh, working with and learned from them. But the Soviets had no computing capacity. They did not have computers. And, you know, someone who went there before me, John Embry, and you can find an interview of him. I think it's on the American American um, Institute of Physics, uh, and and a lot of very good interviews on some of these places are worth uh, running down. But anyway, he when he came back, he went over to one of the meetings before I was involved, and he came back and and they asked him uh, what what could we do to to make things better uh, in the Soviet Union. He says, well, you know, you could get a Xerox machine. Uh, <laughs> that's what it was back then, a Xerox machine. And, uh, but you know, they, they, had, they had machines to do it, but unfortunately uh, they couldn't use them. The reason they couldn't use them was they did not want scientists making copies of things and spreading it around. So you see, in order to get use of a copy machine, you had to get a half a dozen signatures of people up the line, including somebody from the Communist Party. So you see, you, you know, so that sets back science when you have those kinds of um, ridiculous uh, things, but you know, not ridiculous to them. You know, if, if, if copiers were suddenly available, you can imagine the number of novels by uh, Solzhenitsyn and others uh, that's gonna be all over the place. So they, 
Uh, so that was probably a lot of their problem is that they could not uh, have to give freedom to their scientists, couldn't do it. And then, you know, later, if you read the book about Chernobyl and so on, uh, which is a wonderful book, if you haven't seen it, um, about the big accident they had in 1986, I believe it was. Uh, but anyway, but, you know, people were uh, hemmed in. They, they couldn't do the work that they really needed to do because of secrecy. Secrecy, afraid to, to share with other people and scared going up the line. You know, they've always had a member of the party and China has the same problem. They have the same problem. So, you know, right now it seems very open in China, but uh, they have a lot, to, a lot to, uh, to, to learn. I think in the end, they'll have to do that or switch. I don't know what they're going to do. Anyway, that's out of my, <laughs> out of my uh, uh, track. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, going there and, and, and meeting people, the one, uh, one great friendship I had was with a man named Lev Gondon. And he actually later actually was able to emigrate to the United States, and uh, he worked at NOAA. Uh, but he 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 uh, retired in in the Soviet Union at age sixty, and they would not let him uh, uh, immigrate. And the reason was I think he had a brother who had immigrated, and they 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 made the excuse that well he worked at the uh, the laboratory there and he had access to classified information and so forth. But he did eventually, he, he was able eventually to emigrate. Uh, but he was, a, he was really one of the people who greatly inspired, inspired me to build stochastic models of climate, things like that. So he was basically a guy who worked on the, the weather forecasting problem of how do you best uh, massage the data before it goes into the numerical weather forecast. If you don't do that, it'll jump and hiccup and go crazy. Uh, so, so you have to smooth the data and so forth. Anyway, so he was an expert at that, but he knew all kinds and he was a great, a great friend of Badico's. Even during the war, they became friends. And so I always wondered why Badico uh, was fired as head of the main geophysical observatory. And I always thought that it was because he, he uh, hired too many Jews uh, and at the MGO, and Lev Gondon was a very close friend of his, and he was promoted up. Uh, that was always just my own conjecture. People can chew on that if they, <laughs> but uh, um, that was my feeling. And a few people, a few Russians uh, agreed with me, uh, but many people would not. Uh, no, 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 impossible. Uh, <laughs> so and, you, know, Jerry, you have to understand what they are, you know, where they are. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was just going to say, for those who haven't read your book, uh, it's very interesting, your commentary on how you formed uh, these friendships, sometimes when uh, you reached across international lines uh, to do so, um, acknowledging, you know, deficiencies in uh, the American system as well as other systems. Yes. Um, so for those who haven't had a chance to look at the book yet, you're in for uh, a treat when you learn about how these uh, international uh, friendships and very collegial relationships are formed and how uh, Dr. North's work uh, kind of internationalized over the course of his uh, career in different ways. Um, but uh, kind of keeping an eye on the, the clock, I was hoping uh, we might ask you um, to read uh, one of your favorite sections from the book. Um, uh, in fact, maybe you said you would uh, touch on one of your uh, Russian adventures. Uh, well, let me let me try this one. I I uh, I only I, I missed out on uh, the reading, and I think that's my fault. But uh, so I had to quickly uh, find this one. This one happened in my in graduate school, uh, but uh, it kind of reflects some of the things I've already said. Uh, but. Uh, so I had a, I had a, a PhD advisor. My dissertation advisor uh, was a genius, uh, a theoretical physicist. I wanted very much to be a theoretical physicist. Um, and I go on in the book about how, you know, one good thing about physics is you can you can bail out 
at any point, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, postdoc, uh, tenure time. <laughs> and usually there's some, some good kind of work that you can find. And that's the nice thing about the physics thing. So uh, Charles Gable was my uh, advisor, a, a, tr a brilliant um, elementary particle uh, expert. And uh, he, just to give you an idea, uh, he graduated University of Chicago, uh, his undergraduate degree uh, at 18. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, when I was a graduate student, he was just a few years older than me, and he was a full professor. <laughs> so, so, and also he was a he was a teacher. He was he was hard to understand, very hard to understand. But I took a liking to his his way of thinking. So, you know, to be a great theoretical physicist, you have to have this intuition that we've talked about, but you also have to be really good at the hard at the at the digital, not not programming, but mathematics you have to really not make mistakes. And one thing is in theoretical physics, if you if you you should have a lot of ideas based on your intuition about what a good problem is to work on, etc. Uh, but then most of your ideas are wrong. So but if you have the skills to go quickly and check them out by running through all the mathematics and you say, oh, this doesn't work. Uh, well he's the kind of guy who would have the great questions and he could also quickly throw away the bad ones. So, so what I would do uh, is, I, and he never, he never told me anything to do, really. <laughs> and so uh, I would go and screw up the nerve to go in to venture into his office and ask him a question about quantum field theory, uh, the subject of my research. He would spin his chair around and his back to me and face to the window, thinking, I guess, uh, eventually, I would fumble the question out and he would answer in great detail. I would thank him and leave. A few days later, I'd return to his office and announce, hey, I figured out the answer to the problem. I would produce my solution on the chalkboard and his office. He'd say, yeah, that's what I told you. <laughs> so there. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Uh, I later worked with a guy at NASA by the name of Tom Wilhite. And he's still a dear friend of mine today. He actually came to Texas A&M a couple of years after I did. I got him to come down. And he was a genius also. Only he was an experimental scientist. And we worked together to propose and get the trim uh, satellite off, his, off the ground. And, uh, but I said the same thing about him. As I would go in and, and ask him a question, and he'd give me the answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> and come back. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> but I, I learned from both of these men greatly. Well, th well, that should that should make people feel like they can ask you whatever question they want. <laughs> oh, <I laughs> because know. <laughs> you know what it's like to say something and have somebody say, oh, yes, I knew that already. Yeah. So it looks like we have we have a lot of good questions already coming in. If you have more questions, if you're listening on Facebook, put them as a comment on Facebook. If you're listening here on Zoom, put them in our Q&A here on Zoom. And if you don't mind, Jerry, I'll ask you the first question. Okay. Um, here's a really good question. Wave um, your hands, you know, if I'm going on too long. <laughs> a lot of people, yeah. Sorry, I'm we're, the old professor. <laughs> we're right on time. No worries. Um, okay, so so here, here's a really good question, and that is, people still confuse weather and climate. So how would you, having done this for many decades, how would you explain the difference between them in the simplest possible way? Uh, well, let's see. I could, I could, uh, I could uh, you, when you make a forecast of the weather, it's what we call an initial value problem. And your, your forecast, um, and, and I can make, a, suppose you have a, can, a cannon, and you shoot a ball, um, a cannonball, and um, you want to know where it's going to land. Uh, and so you'd like to predict where it's going to land. And but you have an equation that tells you that. But also, you know, there are small errors, uh, and uh, so it never will land in exactly the same spot. So if you look at all the spots after many many times, uh, that's what I call climate, the pattern of results 
uh, and that's not real sensitive to the uh, the angle and so forth. If you move the angle, the whole pattern will move. And that's like changing the climate by changing some external uh, parameter in the problem. But you still have the problem of the errors uh, in the in the forecast. So in other words, you can't narrow it down because the wind is blowing. There are too many little things going on. So, so that's the way I see the difference. Uh, so when we look at something that's forcing the climate to change, like CO2 or maybe the sun's brightness uh, or something else, uh, we only think we can only think of about four things that can do this. Uh, then, uh, uh, so what we'd like to know is when you change one of those external parameters, what happens to the pattern? And that's what climate change is about. So um, uh, another one, uh, you were kind of uh, looking at, at climate science before most people were thinking about it as an issue or a discrete uh, discipline for, for many people. I'm curious about how you've seen awareness change over the years, places you've seen it change, maybe places you haven't seen it, the kind of change you might have anticipated. Well, I was so lucky to get to NCAR at just the time that this was becoming a field. Uh, and I think it really woke up as a field when it was recognized by some people uh, at Princeton, uh, at, uh, at the GFDL, the, the uh, uh, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics uh, Laboratory there that was part of NOAA and the government. Anyway, uh, so people were recognizing the power of modeling uh, weather, they knew about that. And it, it was still very young and making plenty of, uh, a lot of errors. Uh, but there was this thinking, you know, what they did was they, they actually had a, had a little model with only two layers in the, in the atmosphere, just two layers. And now we have 50 or a hundred, <laughs> two layers, one above and one down below, and then maybe the surface would be a third. And what they did was they sort of made it like a, like a, uh, on, on one of the very first digital computers, by the way, uh, there was von Neumann and Charney and a few other uh, notables. Uh, <laughs> notables, <laughs> uh, they're over the top. But anyway, um, the, the, uh, what they found was when they turned it on and just let it go, why the, the, the circulation of the atmosphere, even with just these two layers and a surface, the whole thing organized itself into exactly the climate circulation of the atmosphere. And that was, I mean, just absolutely amazing. I mean, you know, they were, they were doing it on a computer that would be way uh, um, slower than your iPhone now. Uh, but, you know, huge rooms full of tubes and everything uh, to make this thing run. So that was amazing that, that they, that, you know, just turn it on and bang, there's the Hadley cell, there's the, the middle latitude storms, there's everything that we, that we know. <laughs> and we didn't have enough data, you know, but they had a fair amount. So they could say, oh my God, that, that's, that's, that, there's really something there. Uh, and not even uh, thinking about the, the initial conditions, no matter what they were in a few minutes, it settled down to that. So that, that was really startling. So when I went to NCAR, they were just putting together a model with more, you know, more complicated. And by the 60, late 60s uh, at Princeton, they already had uh, what you would now call the general circulation model, maybe had uh, eight or 10 layers and so forth. By then, uh, by the middle 60s, computers were running all over the place. Even at Oak Ridge, I was using IBM 704 and so forth. That's the one with all the punch cards and everything. Uh, in fact, I used one of those that was one of the one of the very early ones called the Oracle, and I talk about that in the book with the paper tape. <laughs> and that was that was really something for me, <laughs> who couldn't even like you know that key punch thing was horrible. 
<laughs> and I went in there and most of the programmers were women, actually. And, uh, and the, my boss was a woman at Oak Ridge. She was a wonderful woman. And uh, she came from Texas, actually, the Corpus Christi. She had a master's in math. She was wonderful. She eventually married P.R. Bell, her, the one we talked about earlier. And, but this thing you had, you know, it was all uh, in hexadecimal and you'd go in this room and there were all these people in there in the key punch room. And it was like uh, uh, the, the subway station, you know, <laughs> the noise, unbelievable amount of noise. And, and, you know, if you make a mistake, you have to start over. I mean, you, you can, you could run it up to where you made your mistake and you had to just look at the dots and see what was wrong. Oh my God. So, <laughs> Well, I, I love hearing those stories because that's just a, that's a piece of history. I mean, I remember, um, you know, I, I, I program supercomputers myself. You never yeah. see them nowadays. You never go near them. You oh, just reach right. them via the internet. But yeah. you actually had them in the days when you literally had to put a punch card into the machine or tape. Yeah. And I actually have a quick question. So one of the things I love about your book is that you have so many old photos in your book. But yeah. I don't think you have, you don't have any photos of those old computers, do you? Uh, yeah, and there, uh, yeah, there is a, a couple there? of them. Let's see if we can find There's them. a lot of really fascinating photos. I mean, that's what I like because Some you can them, see the faces uh, and you can see the places. You know, we, we had constraints and a few of them got placed placed in the in the next chapter or something like that. Oh, okay. I can, I'll, uh, I'll look again for it because there that's... Is a, uh, there is a picture of a guy at the at the uh, at the desk. Uh, oh no worries, I'll, I'll look I'm for sure it. There's that, lots of great he's photos. Of... Anybody's ears. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here well, it is on page forty-seven. Page forty-seven. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's me at the top of the page. And oh yeah. Oh, okay. Here we go. Punch cards. Here we go. Yeah, but that guy was that was the paper paper tape guy. Uh -huh. <laughs> you, you, know, you would stand out in the hall. You'd give him your spool of tape, and you'd stand out and look at him like the like the bakery. You know, where you can watch the the bakers inside. You'd stand there, and so he would take your tapes, and you're standing there outside. You can't talk to him, and he puts it in, and zoom, the thing sucks the tape in, and this is a huge room with all these things in there. And, and it's much just like a, a, a iPhone 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, <laughs> anyway. Uh, but it has, has enough power to do that and you can run programs. And so in, inevitably, you know, I would hand him my, pool, my spool and you have an appointment. You get 30 minutes uh, to run your thing. And, but of course there were other people who wanted on. And right. so, you know, they're waiting. They see a, do a dumbo like me there. They're, st they're standing in line because they know as soon as he puts it in there, it's going to go, zzz, zzz, bang, stops. <laughs> Things in a dead loop or something, <laughs> a death spiral. <laughs> if he doesn't shut it off, the whole thing is going to blow up. <laughs> and so the person behind me says, get out of the way, young man. <laughs> Gets my 30 minutes. <laughs> Well, we, we have a comment from Robert in the chat. He says, I'm 63 and I use punch cards in my computer applications class when I was he studying. Knows. He knows. Sure. Oh, somebody else. Kevin says he used punch cards in his biostatistics class at Texas Tech in 1980. Yeah. So you are not alone, Jerry. Right. Yeah. Well, when I first went to University of Missouri, St. Louis, um, and we were, we were using punch cards, that would be in 1966, 68. 68. So they had punch cards. And certainly when I got to NCAR, one of the things that brought people to NCAR was they had one of the world's fastest computers there. And so people who worked in turbulence, there was, it was a big uh, mecca for people uh, in turbulence because they could run big programs. Actually, they're trivial now. I mean, can you imagine running a turbulence program with, a, with your, your watch? I mean, I mean with your, your iPhone? But you know, they, but that's what they had. So they ran it on a grid of 64 by 64. That was their turbulence model. But you know, people, great, famous people came to visit. And so I actually got to talk to them when they showed up because I was up in the same uh, area uh, where, uh, where the, the, the advanced study program 
was up on the fifth floor. A wonderful place. You've probably been to NCAR many times. That's where the that's where the director sits now. Back in those days, those were the days. Back then, it was where the advanced study program was. So, didn't take long. Didn't take too long. That was so, the end of that. That was the end of that Camelot stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there is there is a chapter uh, in the book about leaving Camelot. Uh, for those yes. of you who haven't read it. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to uh, combine a, a couple of questions that people have put into the, the stream here. Um, uh, Rob Applebaum uh, writes about your work um, in the uh, 70s, looking at uh, aerosol loading, stagnant world temps, um, and wants to know if it was challenging to convince people that greenhouse gases were uh, uh, and are still driving climate. Um, and that the rise that we were starting to perceive in the 1980s was a continuation of a troubling trend and a kind of question uh, that, that chimes uh, with that in the stream is uh, people are curious to know if the science has always been uh, so uh, polarized as it is uh, in, in our seemingly in our moment. Um, so maybe you could speak to uh, how you answered to uh, the, the trends early on when you were beginning to perceive them. Well, you know, uh, I was a bit skeptical about climate change, or, or at least I was interested. Uh, and I got into it really, uh, as you said, out of curiosity. I, was, I thought, gee, this is a really nice physics to physics problem that I, my skills, my little box of toys uh, can uh, go to work on this. Uh, and what it looked like, it, it certainly in my early years of it, was that this might be a tool, the climate models, they might be a tool to help understand the ice ages and paleoclimatology. So in the beginning, that was my motivation. Um, I knew about the CO2 thing. The first time we went to the Soviet Union in 74, 74, no, 76, 70, somewhere in there, 76. Uh, then, uh, you know, Manabe, uh, the famous uh, uh, general circulation modeler, and I hope you get him some time for this series. He's way up in his 80s now, uh, but he's still uh, a, a remarkable man. I've been back and forth. He's read my book, by the way. And I read his, <laughs> anyway, uh, and he did like it. Uh, but anyway, the, the uh, so, you know, other people, he was interested in the CO2, pro CO2 problem because his boss, Magarinsky, uh, who led the, the delegation, my first trip to USSR. Uh, but anyway, um, they were interested in the CO2 problem. And it wasn't clear at the time that it was a big, that it was really an important problem. Uh, so I went the other way for quite a while. And I think, I think it was in the 90s uh, when I started working. Uh, I was already in uh, at Texas A&M and I started working on the, uh, the, the detection of climate change. How do you detect such faint signals in a very, very noisy system? So the climate rattles, the thing just rattles like crazy. Uh, and that's the randomness of the weather in the, in the problem. And uh, so uh, that, that, that was how I got into it. But later it became clear uh, that uh, when, you could, when you could, even when it was still a faint signal, uh, you, could, uh, you, could, you could tell this is important. Uh, uh, but people on the inside knew that. And I was going around Texas uh, making uh, talks. Some people say I was not aggressive enough, but I, I went around talking to people all over the state of Texas, just by invitation, all kinds of garden clubs, all kinds of Episcopal church up in uh, Dallas uh, once on a Sunday, uh, and all kinds of things like that. And uh, so I, I must have given a hundred lectures around. I went time to a, a, a hospital architects you know, they were worried about the trees outside and how, the, how to help the patients. So, so uh, and, and uh, all kinds of things like that. But anyway, I would always say, 
you know, you really need to keep your eye on this. We're not sure yet, but we think this is going to be a big problem. The scientists think that. So, and, but you know, by the, by the late 90s, it was pretty well uh, understood. By this time, uh, some of the, uh, the real advocates like uh, Jim Hansen, uh, who was also a very good friend of mine, uh, still, I haven't heard from him in a long time. Uh, but uh, since I worked at NASA, he was up at, in Manhattan. And so he actually, uh, I went up there several times giving talks and visiting with him. Uh, he was a physicist also, but he was very much an advocate, even in the late 80s. Uh, and he, he gave a, a really important um, testimony in Congress uh, and I think that was in 88, somewhere, uh, probably uh, Catherine can, can pin that down. But, uh, but he was really uh, uh, ready to go to the mats, so to speak, with, that, uh, with what he believed to be the case. And it turned out he was right. It turned out he was right. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of, a lot of people were still skeptical because of his uh, approach. But that's okay. You know, there are many people uh, who, um, you know, I usually don't make uh, too much uh, about uh, what ought to be, how, how we ought to go about this, how, fixing it, how to do it. And I claim, no, I'm a scientist. Um, when it comes to these issues, they really are moral issues, what you do, because no matter how you do it, there will be losers and winners, no matter how. Uh, and I'm no better than, uh, 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 let's say, uh, a movie star or, uh, you know, an ath famous athlete or somebody like that. I mean, that's a moral issue. It should be our moral leaders who are guiding us. Uh, you can talk to Catherine about that. <laughs> I think maybe I'll stay out of it. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, I said, I, I, I told the congressman, I said, you know, I ain't that kind of a doctor. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, well, that actually brings me to to my favorite part of the book, which is actually the very end, um, and this ties into a few of the questions we have. So, I just wanted to share um, part of what I I really enjoy, where you say. You know, scientists find it difficult to leave their workbench or their computer monitor to share their findings with the public, but we're doing it. I mean, you led the way. You were already speaking to, when you said garden clubs, I laughed because I speak to garden clubs. And you yeah. said the Episcopal Church, I laughed oh, because I speak to the Episcopal yeah, Church. Nice. And you know, those people were always so cordial, so nice. Yeah. And even, of course, you know, it was a self-selected audience for the most part, but uh you know, people would come up, you know, people who were real deniers come up and, and have a serious conversation with me. Uh, and, you know, I would try to uh, convince them, but not not being a, a tough guy, uh, you know, not insulting people. That mm -hmm. never helps. Uh, and you know about that. I know you you uh, are pretty good at it. So uh, probably a little more than pretty good. <laughs> Walking in your footsteps, Jerry, many people don't realize that you have been doing this for a very, very long time. And I am literally just continuing on the pathway. I know we don't get a lot of snow here in Texas, but we do get snow in Lubbock. So you mm -hmm. sort of broke the way, so to speak, through the snow. <laughs> and, and we're still walking your footsteps today. So, so at the end of your book, you say, um, you really bring it home. You say, look, anyone can look at the graphs of sea ice decline, mass loss in glaciers, rising sea level, higher temperatures, heavy rainstorms, more wildfires. It's hit it, me in the face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't have to be a scientist anymore to see this. And you say the solution to the problem is clear, reduce the use of fossil fuels. This is well known, but special interests and their influence over less well-informed people will lead to setbacks. However, and I love this, you say, however, I believe that the science will triumph in the end. And um, at the end of the previous uh, chapter, you say, as ever, I am optimistic. So I wanna give the last question to the person who asked on Facebook, what keeps you optimistic? What keeps you from depressed when you have studied this global issue for so long? And here we are today, what makes you hopeful? I am optimistic. I think that, you know, people are now, uh, you know, there are surveys that, that say that uh, more and more people in the United States are uh, bending a little bit. And, you know, there's a great analogy with the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, it's very similar uh, in many, many ways. 
it's a science in a fishbowl, as I say. Uh, the public is watching. Usually a lot of our dirty laundry uh, gets uh, cleaned up uh, without, any, without uh, having to go outside the scientific community. But in both of these cases, you had to do it. You had to do it. And, uh, but now, you know, it's so obvious. I mean, people in Texas, they, they know it's getting warmer. They know it. And farmers know it. Uh, and in the eastern part and, and, and in the, uh, the southeast of the United States, more, more water, more intense precipitation. Out west, fires. We'll see it coming, uh, I think. Maybe not this year, but maybe next. Um, again, uh, it's the pattern that matters, not the individual event. Um, so, no, I am optimistic. I think that we are coming around. Uh, luckily, um, we uh, the, the president now, uh, I think, uh, has uh, good advice, uh, whereas I think the previous president uh, wasn't listening, and I don't, I'm not sure he um, really took it, he, we didn't take it seriously at all. But it is amazing to me that in the government, during George W. Bush's time, a lot of people were critical of him. On the other hand, science marched on. He didn't shut it down. He did not do it. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's the deep state, as they say. But he knew, he knew, I'm sure, that this was serious. But he could not, he could not, uh, his, his, uh, his own party was not up to it. And so he just couldn't do it. He had loyalties to them. And uh, I understand that because he did not, he did not cancel. Trim was uh, launched in uh, 97, I guess that was. And you know, we had a, we had a hard time uh, in the, uh, just as hard a time in uh, uh, the, the um, Clinton administration. Uh, they were pretty tough on us. And I tried to get, I, I was in, on the BASC, the, the, uh, uh, the Board of Atmospheric Science and Climate uh, at the National Research Council. And I was on there and we could not get any money to, to uh, do anything uh, because even there was, there was uh, 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 the vice president uh, trying, to, trying to get climate change going and he couldn't get it to happen even with Bill Clinton. That's right. And that was, of course, Al Gore, who... Um, Al Gore. Yes, yeah. who I was actually just, just talking little, to today. <laughs> a little, little senior blip there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you have so many names and so many details in this book. It is just absolutely mind-boggling. So, Jerry, this has just been incredible. Thank you for spending this hour with us. Um, if you are interested in looking behind the scenes of what climate science and climate scientists look like, I mean, Jerry's book, it will just show you exactly what that looks like. And, and I think probably my favorite part of it is you're such a human, if, if I can say that. You're, you're just so personal and you're telling personal stories as well as stories about colleagues and funny things that have happened. You didn't share the key story. So everybody, if you want to know the key story in Russia, you have to read the book or in the Soviet yes, Union, forgive me. But um, I just think this is such a humanizing look at what it means to really be a scientist. And I just, I thank you so much for writing this book. Thank you for being here with us today. And we wish you all the best in your move to, from one part to the other part of Texas. Great. Thank you very much to everyone, Brian, uh, everyone involved. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you everybody for joining us. And don't forget, we have one more Science by the Glass left this year, where we're gonna be talking about the relationship between climate change and extreme weather. This is recorded, it will be posted on YouTube. You can watch it on Facebook afterwards also. And we'll see you again soon. Bye, Jerry.